Hey everybody, before we dive in, please take a minute and check out the link you see on your screen for a message from my sponsor, The Motley Fool. It's the best way to support this work that Tyler and I are doing, and you can get the top 10 stocks to buy right now. So one of my largest investments, and I'm pretty sure Tyler is an investor too in Berkshire Hathaway. One of my uh, largest. One of yeah, my largest so, too. So it's fair to say that we both agree on this. So this isn't really a bull versus bear take or anything like that. But there are a lot of reasons why that I hear pretty often of why people aren't big Berkshire investors and why they don't think it's a great long-term investment. So we're going to go through some of those and then some of the reasons why it is one of my largest investments. So first, I want to kind of address two of the the negative things I hear before I, I'll, I'll kick it over to Tyler, who's normally the negative one, but I'm going to be negative for a second. Um, so the biggest argument that I hear is that Berkshire is too large to do well from, from here. It has an $824 billion market cap. Um, it's it's just a huge operation. It's really tough to, to generate outsized returns. It's a big argument that I hear. I would counter with the fact that companies like Apple and Microsoft have several multiples of their market cap and have still managed to generate market beating returns. So a, a high market cap or high, uh, you know, just that big size in general doesn't necessarily mean that Berkshire can't beat the market going forward. And that's especially true because it's investable opportunity I would argue is bigger than either Apple or Microsoft because they can literally put their money into anything. There's nothing that could stop them from becoming a $10 trillion conglomerate because they own, you know, 60 subsidiary businesses, a stock portfolio with 40 companies in it. It, it you know, it, the market opportunity is very big. So it can get much, much bigger. The question is, can it beat the market? Um, and then the other big argument I hear against it is, well, Warren Buffett's 93. He's not going to be running this company forever. That's the big part of the investment thesis. And I would argue that it's not anymore. Um, war, the, the succession plan at Berkshire has been absolutely fantastic. Um, the two um, vice chairmen who are running the businesses are essentially doing what they're going to be doing when Buffett's gone anyway. Um, you know, uh, Ajit Jain is in charge of insurance operations. That's not going to change. Greg Abel is going to be the CEO in name, but is already in charge of non-insurance businesses. So he's already doing what he's going to be doing after Buffett's, Buffett's out of the picture. And for the investment portfolio, I would argue that it could actually be a net positive for the, over the long term when, when the portfolio managers, Ted and Todd, uh, so Ted Weschler and Todd Combs take over. Um, in recent years, their picks have actually done better than Buffett's in, in a lot of cases. And it kind of brings like an, they're not, I, I want to say younger because they're both like, you know, fifties and sixties, you know, but, but it brings kind of a more fresh perspective. Like they're the ones who initially originated the Apple stake, which is Buffett's most successful investment ever. That's, they're the ones who got that on his radar. Um, they're the ones who in, invested in Snowflake uh, in its IPO, which is fairly successful for a tech investment in the past couple of years. Um, so I, I'd argue that it's a, it's a, not necessarily a big negative when Buffett is either, you know, is, is just not in charge of Berkshire anymore for one reason or another. He could retire. Let's not, we don't need to be morbid about it. Um, it could happen. Uh, but he is not going to be around forever. The stock could take a dip when he's no longer in charge temporarily. But I would view that as a buying opportunity. So, t Tyler, what are, what are some of the reasons you would try to talk yourself out of owning Berkshire? Yeah, you know, I do this with everything I own, right? Like I, I put on, uh, I'll call it like the negative hat, like the, why doesn't this generate market beating returns? And you don't know, really go out there and try to dig into the company and figure out why that's the case. And the, the things that I keep running into when it, when it comes to right now, buying Berkshire Hathaway, uh, number one, the the non stock portfolio stuff. I know a lot of attention is paid to you know Apple, Coca Cola, everything that's publicly traded. But on the operating side, you have uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe, one of the largest uh, railroads in the country. Uh, Berkshire Hathaway Energy is one of the largest utilities in the world. And when I look at those businesses, they're very cash generative, but they're also relatively thin margin because it does take on quite a bit of debt to do what they do. And as a result, when if we start to see if we are in indeed a higher interest rate environment for a considerable amount of time, as it has to refinance, as it has to refinance debt, 
at these at these subsidiaries, even with all of the cost of capital advantages that, Buff, that Berkshire Hathaway has, it's still going to be higher than what it was. And so it's going to eat away at relatively thin margins. So that's not great, right? You know, good saps cash a little bit. They may need to draw down its existing cash to lower the debt profile at those businesses. You know, it's not the end of the world, but it does slow down the earnings growth of the company in the long run. And because of that, you start to look at it and go, okay, well, if you have slower earnings growth, then that could be a reason why. You also, those particular businesses, I don't know how much more they can grow simply from a regulatory perspective. Like there's never going to be any more like consolidation of railroads in the United States and utilities. They own almost like half the utilities west of the Mississippi already. Like who else is going to let him buy a utility unless they're, I don't know, distressed financially or something like that. So you know, I could see on the operating side, maybe a little bit of slowing down. And that, that's a possibility. And then I look at what it is today. And right now, I know it's kind of hard to value Berkshire Hathaway most of the time, you know, book value. Well, they've bought back a lot of stock and, you know, a lot of things will say that it's undervalued on a book value basis. But I, I just kind of went and looked at free cash flow right now. And, and as we're talking today, Berkshire Hathaway trades at about 29 times free cash flow, which even for a high quality business is a very high price to pay. Like if you told Warren Buffett, hey, there's this great company, it trades for 30 times cash flow, he's going to shut you down right there on the spot, right? And so uh, there's part of me that says, this is a, it's going to be a stable business. It's going to, you know, these are the types of things that are going to last forever. Utilities, railroads, insurance, they, as long as we, you know, need risk mitigation, as long as we need to move goods, and as long as we need to have electricity, these are the sort of businesses that are going to be around. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be like continued uh, market beating returns. And so I think if there was one argument to make against Berkshire Hathaway today, I think that is the one that I would lean on more than anything else. That's fair. I would push back a little bit and argue that Buffett does buy a business that has 30 times cash flow because he keeps buying back Berkshire shares for whatever reason. So fair. He, he does, he does, fair. he does invest it in a high valued business. Um, but so kind of to sum it up, I own Berkshire because I think it's going to marginally outperform the market over time. Um, not deliver the 20% plus returns it has over the past 50 years. I buy it because if the S&P does a 10% annualized return over the next 30 years, Berkshire could do 11. But small differences like that do add up over time when you're compounding gains. Just to kind of uh, give you a couple, a little mathematical example. Say you have two investments. One, get, one grows by 10% a year. One grows by 11% a year. After 30 years, the difference between them will be 544 percentage points of, of growth after a 30-year period. So... That's why I own Berkshire, because it's a long-term investment for me. I don't plan on selling a single share anytime soon, um, and I think it's going to outperform the market, and the, the compounding effect over that over time could be excellent, um, even with it being a big business, with Buffett not being around forever. And for all the reasons Tyler mentioned, it's just it, it's still a, a cornerstone of my portfolio and one that I plan to keep that way. Once again, thank you so much for joining me. Be sure to click subscribe if you don't subscribe to my channel already. And as always, this video is sponsored by The Motley Fool. Be sure to visit www.fool.com slash Frankel to receive the 10, top 10 best stocks to buy now.